will you please accept him by your hand claps, please? <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise God. I praise God for being here. I thank God for my life today. You know, when we left church last night, I was sitting in the car, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you just sit still. Just sit here. Just wait right here. And I was trying to look like there was a car in front of me, and it wouldn't move for nothing. But I wanted to move out of that car and go in this grocery store. But I kept on sitting there, and the Lord said, now, I, I watched these two guys, and they kept on circling around. And this, the Holy Ghost said to me, those guys, there's something not right about them. And when they began to just come up, kept walking around that building, finally they went in the store, and I saw them. They came back out, and they were just walking with something in their hands and when I and then looked like this so Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, now you can go in the store. When I walked in the store, the people in there said, we've just been robbed. And I thank God, hallelujah. Woo. Turn to somebody and tell them, say, God is good. God is good and very good. I don't know about you people, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be in God's service. One more time. Put your hands together if you're glad about it. And you know what? I'm glad to be home. We want you to just join in and sing with us. One more.
Bless you. Well, you know, we're just really happy today. We've got uh, not only Brother James DeWitt Johnson back with us, but Brother Mans H. Hand. <laughs> Amen. So it just shows you how God does things. And, uh, 
Sister Myrna was with us for almost four years, and last Sunday was officially her last time with us, and she is back in Washington, D.C. today. And then we look up uh, this week, and here's Brother H. Han and uh, Brother James DeWitt Johnson. And we just uh, going to see which way the Lord's going to carry this thing. Amen. But as I've always said to you, one thing is certain. No matter how many transitions we go through, he never carries us any way but up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Higher heights and deeper depths in the Lord. And that's what it's all about. Let's look to the book of 2 Kings. And of course, um, I want you to let the Lord speak to your situation in this message today. As I've already said to you, I don't plan to be before you very long. And the only way that I'll be before you long is if the Lord stretches it out. I want to give you a sermon in a nutshell this morning. Second Kings chapter 13. A few years ago, I spoke from this particular text and the subject I'm going to use in a Tuesday night service. I never used this uh, particular message on Sunday morning. In fact, I don't remember whether it's five, six years ago, but I do believe that uh, it is what the Lord has given me for this particular worship. Second Kings chapter 13, if you would uh, begin reading with me, in verse 14. You have it? Amen. Amen. All right, come on, let's read. Now Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphex till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he put, took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. All right, we'll stop right there. I want to talk to you about the arrows of the Lord's deliverance. Would you say that? The arrows, the arrows. of the Lord's deliverance. Lord's deliverance. Amen. Allow your Bibles to remain open. We might uh, just do a little expository preaching on this. Uh, this particular passage of scripture deals with the successor to Elijah. This man even had so much power in his bones when he died that a dead man came in contact with this dead prophet's bones and was raised 
from the dead. Elijah was considered, and uh, we still consider him, as being the mightiest prophet of the Old Testament that ever lived, other than Elisha. But when Elijah was instructed by God, and then here again, you've got to look at him. This man was so great, Elijah, that he could call down fire from heaven and set ablaze an altar that had water instead of kerosene. And the fire was so intense that it consumed the altar, consumed the sacrifice, and licked up the water in the trenches. And yet this man, Elijah, became fearful when he found out that Jezebel wanted to take his life. So he runs away. The Lord gave him to eat and said, now eat all of it because you're going to travel in the strength of this food for 40 days. And he ran until he came to the mountain of God, hid himself in a cave, and the Lord wanted to know, what are you doing here? He said, well, Lord, I tell you, I hid myself because they've killed all of your prophets. And now Jezebel is trying to get me. And the Lord had to tell Elijah something that all of us would do well to know when we wrap ourselves in the cloak of self-righteousness. The Lord told him, man, get up from here. Whining and crying, talking about you the only one. I got 7,000 prophets that I have reserved unto myself who have never bowed their knee to Baal. And when we're around here thinking about God don't have nobody but us, you better hear the Lord saying, I got some more folk you don't even know nothing about. Amen. But the fact that he ran from Jezebel asking God to take his life, the Lord decided, well, what I'll do, you've lost your courage. I'm going to terminate your mission. But you go back and uh, God gave him who to anoint uh, to be king and who to anoint as his successor. And the man that he anointed to be his successor was Elisha. Now, Elisha was out in the field, and uh, Elijah didn't do anything but walk through the field and just kind of touched him with his prophet's mantle, with his cloak, and kept on walking. And Elisha stopped what he was doing and went after Elijah, started following him. And Elijah looked around, what you doing following me? He knew what was happening, but he just wanted to hear the man express himself. And everywhere Elijah went, Elisha followed him, and uh, he asked him, now, what, what do you want? Why are you following me so closely? He said, well, I want a double portion. I not only want 100% of the power and strength that you have, but I want a double portion. I want 200%. And Elijah said, I'll tell you what, it's a hard thing, but if you see me when I go up, in other words, you can't take your eyes off me. If you see me when I go up, the thing that you have requested will be granted. And it was so that uh, when Elijah would go up to heaven in a blaze of glory on a chariot of fire, they were standing down by the banks of the Jordan River, and Elijah had just smitten the waters of the Jordan with his mantle. And uh, the Jordan opened up, and the two of them walked across on the other side. But when they got on the other side, Elijah looked up and saw a chariot of fire that was drawn by horses of fire and the wheels were turning and spinning fire and the horses were chewing on bits of fire and as they were prancing, their hoofs were prancing fire. And uh, all of a sudden, he looked up and the chariot started down. And he got on board that chariot and started upward. And Elisha saw him going up and he said, My father, my father the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And when he said that, Elijah took his mantle and dropped it. In other words, Elijah said, 
I'm not going to need this way I'm going. So he dropped it down to Elisha and Elisha picked it up and to test out the power that he had, he went back to that same Jordan and took the mantle and hit the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the Jordan started backing up for him. So here this man has twice as much power as his predecessor. Praise God. But now this story tells us about the death of Elisha. Uh, verse 14, now Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. Now I want you to know something, folk. It doesn't mean that God is not with you because you get sick. There are those who would tell you that if the Lord is really dealing with you, you have no business ever getting sick. Well, if you never get sick, you'll never know God's a healer. Amen. Amen. I like to sing Andre Crouch's song sometime and that particular verse that I love. And now I thank God for the mountains. And I thank him for the valleys. And I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. Because if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. And I wouldn't know what faith in God can do. But through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to depend upon God's word. So you ought to touch somebody and tell them, it's not a sin for you to be sick. That sickness only gives God an opportunity to heal you. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I know that's right. The writer here says, Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. Now, recognize that the writer is writing this in retrospect. Because the next thing you read after talking about him dying, it says, And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, isn't it strange that the same words that uh, Elisha had used concerning Elijah in 2 Kings 2 and 12, now King Joash uses the same words concerning Elisha. Now Elisha, talking to Elijah as Elijah was going up, he saw Elijah going up and he realized that the preserver of Israel, the preserver of God's people, had not been the armies, but the prophet. In other words, Elisha was declaring that Elijah had been a one-man army. He was saying as he saw him go up, my father, my father, you the chariot of Israel and the horsemen, you're the one that God has used to protect his people. It haven't been the kings, it haven't been the armies, but it has been the man of God. Now Elisha himself is about to die. And King Joash says to him, my father, my father, you've been the same thing to us that Elijah was in earlier times. You are the one that God have used to preserve his people. And I got news for you all. We have a uh, military might such as has not been dreamed of in ancient times. Uh, the United States mobilizing forces in uh, the area of the Middle East and of course uh, Saddam Hussein recognizes that there is no way that with all of his firepower that he can compete with the superpower of the United States. But do you not know with all of our superpower the scriptures are yet true. Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman waited but in vain. And when President Carter made an attempt uh, to rescue those hostages that were being detained at the American embassy in Iran, 
the attempt was failed because the helicopters start falling to pieces. With all of our military might, we still do not have the ability to police the world. We don't even have the ability to safeguard our own coast. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. The only thing that's going to sustain us, we've got to stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I talked this morning in the communion service of three times in the scripture, there in the 12th chapter of the book of uh, Exodus, when the Lord was getting ready to deliver his people Israel from the land of Egypt, that night when he would bring them out, he gave them a token by which their lives would be spared. He said the blood of the lamb, the blood shall be a token unto you in the houses where ye dwell. And the Lord said when the deaf angel comes through and smite the land of Egypt, the thing that will save you from death will not be your militia, but it will be the blood of the lamb. In the second chapter and in the sixth chapter of the book of Joshua, when Israel would come into the city of Jericho to destroy the cities of Jericho, of the city of Jericho, that one woman, Rahab the harlot, was the only one that had a token of assurance that her house wouldn't be demolished. They said, the spies said to her, this scarlet cord, this red cord, this symbol of the blood that's hanging from your window, the cord by which you let us down. When we come back to destroy Jericho, have your father, your mother, all of your family and all of your possessions inside of this house. We will not be held accountable for those who run out of the house into the streets. But those that abide here, you'll be spared and nothing will happen to you. In Ezekiel chapter 9, the Lord instructed that the people in the city who did sigh and cry, those who were concerned about the abominations taking place, God said, put a mark on them. Then he sent forth six men with destroying weapons, saying, everyone that doesn't have the mark in their forehead to cut them down, kill them, and start at my sanctuary. And folk, it's going to be sad when the Lord does allow war to break through on the mainland of the U.S. It's going to be tragic if nuclear missiles start heading in our direction because a whole lot of God's folk are going to be destroyed because we are not concerned. Nothing moves us. Nothing gets through to us. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. People can be murdered right in the block as long as they're not related to us, we don't care. Young folk can be hung up and strung out on dope, but until it hits our house, we don't care. Whatever's going on, we don't care. But the Lord wants people who can be touched. Touch somebody and tell them God don't want cool folk. And he certainly don't want cold folk. He want people that can be touched. Hallelujah. And I want you to know today that the only way we can escape destruction in this 20th century, in the decade of the 90s, as we head toward the 21st century, there are more and more diseases to contend with, more drug problems, more problems that we can't even describe. But the only way you're going to be able to escape the wrath and escape the destruction of our age, you're going to have to be marked by the blood of Jesus. And I don't mean just come into the door, but in the, the land of Israel, when they walked in the door that night in Egypt, through the door that was covered with blood, they had to stay there. Too many folk come to church on a special Sunday like today. Hello. Shout down the aisle and shed two or three tears and walk back out tomorrow. You're not going to be saved going in and out. Touch somebody and tell them you're going to have to get in Jesus and stay there. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Elisha is greeted by Joash. Joash says, my father. He's weeping because Joash is the king. And the king recognizes that Israel, if they have to trust in him as the king and have to trust in their armies, that they don't have a chance against the Syrians. So he begins weeping over the prophet who is lying upon his sick bed. But look at verse 15. And Elisha said unto him, the prophet is saying to the king, take bow and arrows. In other words, I want you to get your bow. That's that curved instrument with the string running from uh, one end down to the other. Then the arrow is that which he puts within the bow against the string and pulls it back for leverage and power, then releases it and the arrow is propelled to its target. So the king said, take the bow and take the arrows. And when the, the king took the bow and the arrows in his hand, then the sick prophet Elisha put his hand on top of the king's hand. I want you to see something here. The prophet is getting ready to die. Joash the king has to lead his army in battle. So he is the one that will actually be going forth to fight. But as an act of blessing the king who is the leader of God's people Israel. Elisha takes his hand and puts his hand on top of the king's hand. And then he says, shoot. In other words, when he released the arrow, the hand of the prophet was on top of his hand. So the arrow that was released was a blessed arrow. Can I hear somebody say, it was a blessed arrow. Hallelujah. He opened the window first. And he told him to shoot eastward. Now, the biblical scholars disagree that this city, Aphex, is the same city that is mentioned earlier in the scriptures. The first city of Aphex that we read about in the Bible was a city that was located west of the Jordan River. But this city is located east of the Jordan. But the name Aphex itself means secured or fortress. So he says, I want you to shoot eastward. And he shot the arrow eastward. And he said while the arrow was flying, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. Can you imagine that the arrow is flying in the air, heading eastward in the direction of the city where the Syrians had made their stronghold? But while the arrow is flying eastward, the prophet says, I want you to say this with me. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. Now look at what he does here. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphex till thou hast consumed them. Now, if King Joash had had the right kind of a spiritual vision, he would know that all the prophet is trying to do now is build his morale for battle. You notice how when we keep getting the report every day about our troops, in Saudi Arabia, everybody's concerned about their morale. How is their spirit? How are their spirits? You're not going to be able to do much fighting the enemy when your spirits are down. When you're feeling depressed and you want God to just bless you cause you down, he's not going to do that. Therefore, with what? Joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Neither be ye sorry because what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. 
When you get ready to fight the enemy, you can't fight the enemy in a sluggish, lackadaisical, apathetic attitude. You're going to have to have some kind of enthusiasm. The prophet is about to die and he's trying to stir the king. So he told him, now I want you to take these other arrows that you have not shot and just start beating the ground with them. Take the arrows and hallelujah, he took them. He said to the king, I'm in verse 18, smite upon the ground. In other words, I want you to kind of do like the Indians. I want you to get a wall dance going. Take these arrows and, and, and just hit the ground. And what did he do? He took the arrows and said, like some of you. Say, you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Oh, yeah. Everybody that wants the Holy Ghost, come on up here praising God. And here you come. Come on, lift up your hands and praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You ain't going to get nothing. <laughs> You're going to have to have some enthusiasm. The arrow is flying toward Aphex. The sick prophet is trying to get King Joash out of his apathetic state, out of his lethargic state. Come on, take the other arrows and smite on the ground. And he does a... And the prophet just got mad at it. I think I know what he felt. Monday night, the opening night of our convocation, we were in the process of receiving the offering, and I was singing, think that, yeah, I'll make the darkness light before you, and saints all over the building, oh, they were clapping their hands and praising the Lord, and the Lord said, I want you to observe, and I looked, and I saw preachers in that clergy collars. And I tried to make it as nice as I could, but my righteous indignation was stirred. How are we as preachers and missionaries, licensed, credential carrying folk, going to pull the layman out of the rut when we're sitting up here with no joy, sitting up here with no enthusiasm? When you do something for God, God wants you all, or he wants nothing at all. You ought to tell somebody that God wants you all. Or he wants nothing at all. Thank you, Jesus. You remember when David was bringing up the Ark of the Covenant? Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Ark had been out of the possession of Israel for a while. First time they tried to bring it up, they didn't read the scripture. They didn't do it right. Put it on a new cart. And when that cart hit a bump, the ox started to fall. And what was the man named Yuza, Uzza, whatever his name was, tried to stop it from falling. And he touched it and fell dead. Folk didn't understand how, how could a merciful God strike the man for trying to stop the ark from falling. But if he had read the scripture, the ark was only supposed to be touched by consecrated hands, by the priestly tribe, by the Levites. And a few more years passed, but then when David went and got the ark and was bringing it successfully, oh hallelujah, into the city of David, David was running in front of it, leaping and dancing. Hello, somebody. The Bible said he danced with all his might. But when his wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked out of the window and saw him, she despised him in her heart. Soon as David got inside, she said sarcastically, how glorious was the king of Israel today as he shamelessly uncovered himself. He was like the Bezer fellows. But I hear David when he said, woman, let me tell you something. I'm paraphrasing. Maybe I look bad to you today, but all, all the next time that I get a chance to praise my God, 
I'm not only going to praise him till I look bad to you, but I'm going to praise him till I look bad to myself. If you really want God to move in your behalf, you got to quit trying to be so pseudo sophisticated and calm and reserved and cool and you're going to have to learn how to give God your all. Woo! Hallelujah! 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 Sit down just a minute here. Elisha put his hand on Joash's hand and said, shoot eastward. And he shot the arrow. While the arrow is flying, he said, now take those other arrows and strike the ground. And he should have been down there just striking. But he was doing a one, two, three. And the prophet, the man of God, verse 19 says, and the man of God was wroth with him. In other words, he got angry with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Now suppose you knew when you got up and started praising God, hello, that God was going to give you victory just as many times as you clapped your hands. If you knew that, I know you wouldn't be standing up there clapping like this. If the Lord said, okay, when the devil strike you over the next year, I'm going to deliver you three times. But you know the devil is going to hit you every day. He's going to hit you at, the, at work. When you come home, he's going to hit you at home. You go out to do something in your yard, he's going to hit you in your neighborhood. You go to the grocery store, the shop, and he's going to challenge you there. So if you know that how many times you clap your hands, that's how many times God will deliver you. You'll stand up and... Hello, somebody. If you know that he's going to deliver you according to how long you praise him in the dance, you'll quit doing this. And you'll start praising him. Hallelujah. Sit down a minute. I'll be through in a minute. Sit down. Hey, glory. Hey. He said, look what you should have done. You should have smitten at least five or six times. Because if you'd have kept on smiting the ground, every time you hit the ground, it meant that many times when the Syrians come after you, that many times God is going to deliver. And I want you to know as many times as you praise the Lord, that's how many times God's going to give you the victory. As many times. Hey. As you put your trust in him, that's how many times he's going to bring you out. But when the devil beats you down and gets you quiet in the corner, don't look for God to bring you out because the Lord is not going to bring you out while you are whining and crying and feeling sorry for yourself. But you got to come on out of that corner and tell the devil I'm going to praise him. No matter what's going on. <laughs> Sit down, y'all. I'm fixing the clothes. Well, preacher, what do you mean? The bow and the arrow. Touch somebody and tell them the bow is not the arrow. Neither is the arrow the bow. Hello. Both of them have their place. The bow 
is that which propels the arrow. Tell somebody else that the bow is that which propels the arrow. It sends the arrow where you want it to go. But turn to somebody else and tell them the arrow is the missile that hits the target and destroys it. Woo! Well, preacher, if that's the case, how does that fit with me? Hmm. Tell somebody else the arrow is the word of God. Oh, y'all don't hear me. You see, when you get in a fight with the devil, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty under God to the tearing down of strongholds. And when you fight according to what Paul says in the book of Ephesians, I believe it's that sixth chapter, he tells us the wherefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and he gives us the defensive armor that we put on helmet of salvation y'all don't hear what I'm saying breastplate of righteousness lawns girt about with truth hallelujah put on those sandals that are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace the shield of faith but you got one offensive weapon it's the sword of the spirit in other words it's your arrow which is what the word of God the only thing you got to fight with is the word of God but now how please sit down y'all just a minute the question though, how do you get the word to be propelled as a missile to hit your target? You got to have a bow. Touch somebody and tell them the bow is your faith. Woo In other words, you got to send your arrow of the word upon the bow of faith. Tell somebody that send your arrow of the word upon the bow of faith. <sighs> Somebody said, well, preach, explain that to me. Walking around here quoting scripture without faith ain't going to do it. Walking around here trying to tell the devil how much you studied. And the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you want them for everything. You can't shoot the arrow unless it's got faith. But you get in a condition of want. When the children are crying and ain't no food at home. And then you call God to his word. And say, the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. When you shoot that arrow with faith. I declare somebody will knock on the door. Ah, glory. Hey. I'm trying to quit, but I feel my help about now. Listen, let me just tell you, sit down, please, y'all. Let me tell you just a few of the arrows. I only want to tell you about four, about four arrows, four or five arrows that's in your bag. Hallelujah. You don't need to sit here and let the enemy whip you. Take your bow of faith, and every time the devil shoot in your direction, shoot an arrow at him. Y'all don't hear me. Look at some of the arrows that's in your arsenal. When sickness, disease, and infirmity is in your body or in the family member's body, what am I going to do? I'm going to take my, fo my bow of faith, and I'm going to shoot in the direction of the enemy I'm going to shoot Exodus 15 and 26 and I'm going to shoot the name that the Lord gave Moses 
when they came to Mara, where the waters were bitter, I'm going to shoot at the enemy. Jehovah Rapha, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. And while he's reeling from that, I'm going to shoot Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3 at him. I'm sick, but bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities? Who healeth all of thy diseases? And while the enemy is reeling from that, I'm going to reach back and shoot another one at him. Psalm 143 and 3. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness. And those uh, that have been long dead, uh, but oh glory to God. Uh, I want you to know what the Lord does. He heals. Can I hear somebody say he heals? He heals the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And while the enemy is reeling from that, I'm going to shoot another arrow. Isaiah 30 and 26 said he healeth the stroke of their wounds. And while he's yet reeling from that, I'm going to shoot Acts 10, 38 at him. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Yeah. Y'all sit down, please. I tell you, I'm almost through. Then when the enemy tries to destroy my home, I'm going to shoot Acts 16 and 31 at him. Uh, where it said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Touch somebody and ask them, is the devil giving you a fit at home? Keep believing God until he saved your whole house. Glory! And I go back to Exodus 12 and 13. My God, if he's trying to destroy your home, shoot this one at him. Shoo. Devil, my house is covered with the blood. For Exodus 12 and 13 says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood I'll pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt you ought to tell somebody you can rest easy at home now because your home is covered with the blood then when the enemy Anybody in here been having any trouble with the enemy bothering your finance? In other words, has the devil been messing with your money? Yeah, I see him sticking his head up over there saying he's going to strip you. But you ought to just take that bow and pull back the string and let's shoot the arrow at him. Well, what did I just shoot? I just shot at him Psalm 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Wait a minute, we better shoot one more to make that one effective. Come on, shoot it at him. Well, what did I just shoot at him that time? I just shot at him Haggai. Chapter 2, verse 8, where the Lord said, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. Tell somebody, the bank don't own it. 
they are only a resource. My heavenly father is the source. Well, let's shoot one more here. We're going to really get these finances loose now. Come on, pull back on it. Touch somebody and tell them, touch somebody and tell them, I just shot Psalm 84 and 11 at the devil. And you know what that said? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk upright. Hey! Hallelujah. 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 Come on, turn around and ask somebody. Is the enemy trying to inundate you with trouble? Let's shoot another hour at him. Come on, draw back, shoot it. He gonna really have trouble with this one because we just shot two arrows at once. One of them was Isaiah 43, verse one and two. And it says, but now thus saith the Lord, that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not. Can I hear you say, fear not. Hey, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest, through the fire thou shalt not be burned neither shall the flame kindle upon thee and you know when the devil tried to move and miss that one he ran into Isaiah 59 and 19 and you know what that one says when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him I don't know what you're going through, but take your bow of faith. Shoot your arrow of the word. Shoot it at the devil and say the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. I'm going to make it. I'm going to win because I got an arsenal at my disposal. Now you know what you got, are you going to use it? Come on, ask somebody. Now that you know what you got, are you going to use it? Woo! Are you going to use it? You going to use it? I think I'm going to quit right there. Woo! Hallelujah! Let the Syrians come. Let the Philistines come. Let all of the devil's folk come. I'm, I'm not afraid of them because God put some arrows in my bag. God gave me a bow of faith and I'm going to shoot it every time the devil stick his head up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the victory. God is on my side and I got the victory. Can you say that God is on my side and I got the victory? Tell about three more people that God is on my side and I got the victory.